For the next 60 minutes, you will watch me and Bryce Zabel talk about UFO disclosure. Beyond Bryce having been an award-winning journalist, the active editor for Trail of the Saucers for Medium, having authored AD After Disclosure with Richard Dolan, and having created many primetime television series, he's also the co-host of the show Need to Know with Australian investigative journalist Ross Colthart. But enough about that. Let's enter our epic conversation. So Bryce, I have a question for you. You recently published an article in the debrief titled, What Do They Know About Us? Which was a really great article. You discussed the proposition that non-human intelligence is sucking, sucking up all our communications, whether that's text messages, emails, uh, digital books, digital music, our television programming, and, and potentially utilizing that information to plug it into AI programs to learn about us. And an angle that I would emphasize is to game plan us. Yeah, yeah. And, and so my, my question is, is, and this kind of factors into a hypothesis I uh, created not too long ago, a couple of years ago called alien AI hypothesis, where I think we are being, uh, let me put it this way. I think there's a good chance or a decent chance that we are being manipulated. And I came up with an axiom that goes like this. The more advanced the civilization becomes, the more calculated all of their actions become, and the more adept they become at influencing the future precisely how they want it to be. So the idea, and I'll just I'll now share sure. a, a Dr. Robert Burke's uh, quote that, that helps me set this up. He writes, for reasons that are only known to them, they have chosen not to impose on our culture, culture irrefutable displays of their physical presence. Fine. But inevitably, there is disclosure. They know that there's disclosure. And according to my alien AI hypothesis, they are manipulating us and they baited governments around the world to cover this up. They, they calculated that by doing so, it would lead to a positive outcome. Now, I'm being optimistic here, but that's kind of the direction my alien AI, AI hypothesis goes. Now, as an inevitable consequence of that, there are people being born right now. There are young people that are 10, 12, 15, that are going through middle school, going through high school, and, and there's young people going through college and so forth. Eventually, these young people are going to learn through the curriculum, if me and you are right about the UFO subject, mm -hmm. they're going to learn that not only did, that, that, that the United States government and other, other governments uh, initiated campaigns to get people off the trail of the reality of our place in the universe. They obfuscated, they lied, and, and, and also our great institutions were gullible to this and, and ignored the UFO issue, at least partly because of propaganda orchestrated by government interests. So my question for you, Bryce, is how do you think the young people, babies that are born now that will eventually be exposed to curriculum where they learn all this, and they're going to learn this in high school, they're going to learn this in middle school, they're going to learn this in university. How is that going to impact their psychology in, in, in terms of how they view the mm. uh, governments and how they view institutions? Are they going to have like a, a much a, a very overly deficient respect for our institutions when they have to learn that governments were so bizarre and, and so dishonest that they actually... Um, for, for not just for a day, not for a week, but for decades and decades, led their own species astray on their place in the universe. How is that going to affect people that are, that are going to be going through high school and middle school and elementary school and universities going forward? What's your take on that? Well, there's a lot to unpack in what you just said, Ryan. And uh, the, the, the truth of the matter is, uh, we don't know, but we can speculate about it. I have uh, three children. They're all young adults now. Uh, none of them have had children yet, but they're about to. And when they do, that's the group you're talking about. What are they going to be thinking about the world that they've been born into as they grow up and become conscious of it? Because by the time of my children's children are adults, I mean, this secret will be long out of the bag. Um, so, so here's how I would look at it. Um, a few years back, as, as you well know, I wrote a book with Richard Dolan called AD After Disclosure. And what we tried to do is to say, let's take a look at what the world's going to look like by taking a look at what the world was, what, what things give us uh, some input about how this might turn out. Well, here's one way to look at it. Uh, I grew up uh, in a world that had the Vietnam War and then Watergate. 
both things and Kennedy's assassination. So pr the world prior to uh, Kennedy's assassination was one where people actually trusted the government pretty well. Uh, the government had won the war uh, against Hitler. And then along comes the JFK assassination. That wasn't good. Then along comes the Vietnam War, where they're lying about body counts. That wasn't good either. Then along comes Watergate, where Nixon is lying about everything. And that was not good either. And so my generation sort of grew up thinking you can't you can't trust the government anyway. So uh, we're not surprised, I think, right now that this is happening. I'm certainly not. And I think probably what will happen is my kids, for example, I don't think they think about it that much. They, it's kind of as a matter of course to them that the government probably has been withholding information. I don't think that would surprise them in the least they, because they were born into a world where that's already an article of faith. So to answer your specific question, what are the people being born into the world now going to think? Uh, well, they're going to think about UFO disclosure and the world of lies that the government had to tell or thought it had to tell to keep the secret for so long. They're going to think about it as history. All right. So like right now, uh, the Kennedy assassination is is personal to me because I remember hearing about it as a kid, uh, but it's not personal to my kids. Right. 9-11 uh, is personal to them, but it won't be personal to their kids. Uh, in, in some respects, these history books are all going to be rewritten. And uh, we can pretty well, you and I, uh, among a, a small group of people, know what that's going to entail. There's a lot of things that were going on in the, in the history that we observed and lived through that had to be a little bit different if this giant secret was being kept all these years. And so I think they'll be reading history books that analyze it. And when my grandkids get into college, I think they'll be taking classes where professors stand in front of students and talk about what you just said. How was it possible for a secret of this magnitude to, to have been kept for 75 plus years? How did that happen? And I think people will study it and talk about it, and it, it will become, again, part of the new history books. Great, great. So my next question is, because you, recently you put up a poll on Twitter asking UFO Twitter or the Twitter sphere when they think disclosure right. will dawn. So I'm going to go ahead and ask you when, I mean, because I mean, it's especially with all these hearings going on and all the progress we've made over 4.5 years, when do you think Bryce disclosure will dawn? Well, this is an interesting point. First of all, let's go back to that poll. I was, uh, I was kind of, uh, it, it's it's still up, but it's got a lot of votes. I mean, it's like fifteen hundred votes or something right now. Uh, people were really interested in in weighing in, and the and the options they were given were uh, like it's like any day now versus in the twenty twenties and the twenty thirties or never, you know, dream on. And uh, what what seemed to be winning out was there were uh, a majority of people that were either in the any day now or in the 2020 column. So I would say among people who are on UFO Twitter or who are sort of actively thinking about this issue, there seems to be a certain amount of optimism that we're getting to the place where uh, it's it's going to happen in this decade. And I have to tell you, and, and I'm actually curious as well about your own thinking about it, but I think we're both pretty similar. It sure looks like the pieces are in place now for a disclosure uh, mindset to take over, if not a disclosure event. But, but again, uh, like with everything, it depends on how you define it. So for the sake of argument, let's just let me answer your question by defining disclosure in the most limited sense. In the most limited sense to me, disclosure is when the majority of the world uh, of all countries, all citizens everywhere, pretty well accept that we are not alone because they've seen evidence to that effect. All right. Doesn't mean that the governments have downloaded gigabyte drives to every citizen to show them all the pictures. Doesn't mean everything that was classified got unclassified. It just means that we're all pretty much on board now realizing we're not alone. And it isn't like there's some other race out there in some star system, 75 million light years away. No, they're here in our skies and our seas somehow. Okay. How do I feel about that? I think we're close. 
I think we're closer now than we've ever been in my entire life. And my life's gone on a while now. And I've, I've never seen a moment in history where I literally feel like I could, uh, you know, go to my computer on any given morning, turn it on and find out that something has happened and the cat's out of the bag. What do you think? Yeah, well, I know it's you had Luis Elizondo on your show very recently, and he said something that Mike Gallagher said very recently on another show, which is that the Pentagon has pissed the uh they, they have literally pissed the Congress off and you really don't want to piss the Congress off. They feel like they're not be given straight answers. They're not given clarity. They're obfuscating. They're being confusing intentionally. And I think that's pretty clear, at least when I watched the recent hearing, that's the impression I got. And so they, they've made themselves uh, some pretty big opposition to, to their narrative. And as a result, what I think is, is going to unfold is that the Congress is not going to stop. They're not going to be like, oh, okay, well, that's, right. that's it. Congress has told us what they had to tell us. And that's no, there's too many pilots. There's too many radar operators. There's too many former uh, heads of DIA, heads of CIA um, and high level officials that have come out. Even Barack Obama yeah. stated that there is footage and records of craft maneuvering in ways that not we can't duplicate or not easily understandable. Former DIA, former head of DIA, John Ratcliffe said this technology, we can't duplicate it. So there, there, there is this there's this huge contradiction that I think is glaringly unfolding mm. right now. On the one hand, everyone that should know is telling us this is real and yeah. it doesn't look like it's it's of human origin. But the, right. but the Pentagon's like, well, you know, we don't really have too much information. I mean, that's just screams <laughs> yes, right? It it doesn't fly. I mean, <laughs> I literally uh you know, I got up early. I You're on the East Coast. I'm on the West Coast. So I think the hearing started at, what, nine o'clock your time. They were six in the morning, my time. So I got up early, made myself a cup of coffee, sat down, hoped for the best. And as I watched it, I just thought, um, look, it's a huge step forward that there's hearings. It's just who they chose to put before them and, and how they chose to tell their story was uh, insufficient for me to feel really good about it. I, I thought they could have done a lot better job. However, I think they will. I mean, I, I you're hearing the same things, uh, Ryan, I, that, that I'm probably hearing, which is we're going to have some, a new, new set of hearings soon. Um, maybe like next week, kind of soon, because remember these hearings, were, we were cruising along. Uh, I, I had done a, a show with uh, my uh, podcast partner, Ross Coltart, called Congressional Hearings. We put it up on the, the Internet and two days later, they announced congressional hearings. We were like, what? How did that happen? So we were pretty amazed. And, and then they said, oh, we're going to have them next Tuesday. So they went from, yeah, guess what? We're going to have hearings next Tuesday. And, and then they happened. They just were like. Bam. So I think we're about to get that again, because uh, I imagine, um, well, well, I assume most of your uh, listeners and viewers uh, are deeply uh, entrenched in all of this. So these names aren't going to be any surprise. But I imagine myself uh, who might be watching these House hearings that were that would be a little bit irked by it. And I was thinking the uh, senators uh uh, particularly Senator Kirsten Gillibrand and Senator Marco Rubio, who sponsored the amendment that got the NDAA to kick more money in for all this investigation. They've seen, we all know they've seen better videos, they've seen better photos, and they know this thing is real and that it's on. And I, I'm sure they want to get back in the game. So, um, and 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 just, just to circle back on that thing, I, I I saw these guys from the Pentagon sort of cherry picking the, the standard blurry thing in the sky and saying, gee, they couldn't even get it up on the screen properly. But I saw them, you know, trying to get it up there and 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 saying, now, this is hard to interpret it. It could be this or it could be that. Well, you know what? I, I found that insulting because we all know they have better video and better photos. So if it was truly going to be a, a transparent hearing, which it was not, if it was going to be that, they'd have started by saying, okay, folks, fasten your seatbelts. Don't go anywhere. Get your coffee. Sit down. We got a 23-minute video we want to show you. And after we've shown it to you, then we're going to talk. And that would have, you know, you and I would be having an entirely different conversation today had they done that, but they may soon. Yeah. And so that brings me to this question. 
I mean, from my perspective, if they would have shown a really compelling video, they would have gotten that 3000 pound gorilla off their back and they would yeah. have started the process immediately. I really, I'm dumbfounded that they're continuing to delay this because it, it's not going to benefit them. It's going, it's going to make them look worse. So if you were the top advisor to the top mm. brass in the Pentagon and in the Air Force, and let me just say something about the Air Force. The Air Force has been completely quiet. The Air right. Force has F-22s that fly, fly in training ranges off the Eastern seaboard, the same training range that the F-18s from the Navy do. All these pilots have come forward saying on a near daily basis, these F-18s have been picking up targets from their radars. Meanwhile, those F-22s that the Air, Air Force has, has superior radars. And so presumably has also been picking up the, the those targets. And yet the Air Force has been has been completely silent, which is just so bizarre to me. So my question to you is, what would you tell the top brass of the Air Force, mm. the top brass of the Pentagon to persuade them to come clean sooner rather than later so that there's less potentially blowback? What would you tell them? Well, I do think that they need somebody uh, to give them good advice at this point. Um, I, I'm not going to minimize how challenging this is for these people. Some of these people, I, I'm assuming, feel that they have made mistakes and and they don't know quite know what to do about it. Some of them might feel that they've committed criminal acts, but most of them, I think, probably think that they're patriotic Americans and they've been doing what they were told to do and trying to do their best at it. But it's clear that in the cycle of history, we've reached a point where the center is not going to to, to hold any any much longer than than it already has. So so I guess what I would say to them is. Um, well, let me just back up a second. Ryan, I had one very unusual experience in my life. I was the chairman of the, the television academy when 9-11 hit. And um, the Emmys were supposed to be held on September 16th of that day, uh, of that year. And of course, we had 9-11. Now, I'm not trying to compare my experience with disclosure in any way other than to say, it's a big event and you got to figure out how are you going to manage it? And, and, and what, what rules are you going to apply to it? So if I was going to give them advice, I would draw from my experience there and say, well, transparency is transparency. If you're going to talk about it, then don't be cute. You know, lay it out and uh, let the chips fall where they may. Involve the people in the process. Um, if there's apologies that need to be made, make them. If there's responsibilities that need to be accepted, accept them. Um, but understand that probably the reality of what they have to disclose is stranger, Ryan, than you imagine or I imagine or any of your listeners or viewers imagine. Uh, it's quite possible that for these last 75 years, some very bright and probably patriotic, more or less Americans and people worldwide have all been looking at this going, OK, uh, can we put, punt this down the field a little bit longer before we have to actually come clean about anything? Because I'm not quite sure what to say. And, and I do understand that. I mean, obviously, what president wants to say things are you know, violating our airspace, they're harassing our militaries. We don't exactly know who they are, or what they want. We can't do much about it. OK, good night. Have a have a nice life. Nobody wants to say that. So what I would simply say to them is uh, we're all in the dark. You're a little less in the dark than us. You have better photos. You have better pictures. You've studied it longer. But uh, the tide of history is against secrecy at this point. The tide of history is on uh, letting the chips fall where they may. So when you disclose whatever you are capable of disclosing right now, you need to do, uh, you, you've got a couple of things you have to do. The first, of course, is to make it clear to the people that you're, you're, you're not going to hold back truth, although there are still going to be a few things that you're going to keep classified, and then explain your reasons for it. But the thing that I would say you can't screw around with anymore is the most basic thing which is we have now pretty much been told in reports that this is not our black technology flying around because we wouldn't be harassing our own military. We've been pretty much told by the top level people that it's not China and it's not Russia. And so I always say, if that's the case, do the math. I mean, who, who else is that left? And so they can fuss the details and allow the details to bleed out a little bit at a time. But the basic thing that they have to come clean about is it's not us. 
It's not Russia. It's not China. It's not a human intelligence we're dealing with here that we're confirming. They have to do that. And then they have to let it let the ride begin. Yeah. And, and the way I see it is that one of the primary reasons they don't want to broach the UAP issue is because of the uh, long history through testimony, but I'm sure they have all the sensor data to confirm it, of UAP being very interested in, in nuclear assets, whether it's weapon depots, right. whether it's uh, nuclear laboratories, uh, yeah. carrier strike groups, submarines, or even uh, there's this this thing that George Knapp, there's this thing that, yeah. that George Knapp said that I found really interesting. I think he's, he said it multiple times. He said that when they were detonating nukes out in the Nevada test range, they were actually hiring people to look out for UAP. And he said, sometimes a UAP would show up a little bit before the detonation, right. a little bit after, and sometimes even during. So the way I feel is like, okay, you, you've covered this up for a long time, understood. Maybe you had good reasons to do it, but when you finally come clean, you definitely have to be transparent on one of the big reasons you covered it up. And that's because whatever these U UAP are, they're really interested in our nuclear uh, nuclear capabilities to the extent that there have been in incidents where they've actually tampered with the technology. So to, to, to ask you my next question, and you can comment on yeah. what I just said as well, Elizondo said that there's going to be another Elizondo, which I found really fascinating. Yes, and for the longest, absolutely. For the longest time, Elizondo was basically the tip of the spear, the face of the disclosure movement. And I salute him. He's done a great job for, for helping to uh, propagate transparency. Um, do you think it's important that another Elizondo comes out? And secondly, how is the Pentagon going to deal with another uh, Elizondo if they keep right. obfuscating? Because the next Elizondo is going to say exactly what the first Elizondo said. Meanwhile, we're getting hearings where they're acting like they don't know anything. It's just it's just bizarre. Well, there's two things here. Let's talk about them. First is uh, the nu nuclear issue. And the second is a, a second uh, Elizondo. Uh, on the nuclear issue, I, you know, I think we have to acknowledge what a thorny issue it is. I keep hearing or seeing people write where, oh, well, you know, they're just trying to save us from ourselves. Okay, that's possible. I mean, it that is a possible explanation. This, I don't think we have any evidence that that's the case. The other possible explanation is they're conducting uh, information gathering, much as I suggested in that that article that just appeared on the debrief that, we, you know, we don't really know. But if, you know, they're certainly capable of gathering information, they certainly are interested in our nuclear weapons. And they appear to have shown some interest in being able to turn them off. So I don't necessarily look at that as a good thing. Um, I, I sort of uh, go back to the, the Reagan years when he was saying about the Soviet Union, but there was a phrase, trust but verify. Uh, we may need to, in the future, as we begin to deal with this other intelligence or intelligences, uh, we may need to trust but verify. We may need to to try to reach out in a, in a way that that says uh, we want to have a, an honest relationship with whatever you represent, uh, but we we need you to uh, assure us in in a valid way that we're not at risk. Okay, so that that's one one issue. The other about the other Elizondo. Well, look, uh, I'm a you know uh, I spent most of my career in the media. I was a CNN correspondent. I was a reporter for a PBS station and and local stations. I know how the news business works. And so the question about uh, will there be another Elizondo? Well, a part of that is if Lou Elizondo actually does retire off the scene, as he's threatened to do many times, then, of course, there will be another, quote, Elizondo, because the media uh, needs to put a face on this story. Uh, and the question is, who, who is that face? Elizondo is, it has been interesting because while not exactly a whistleblower, he kind of plays like a whistleblower to most people. He was the inside man. Now he's on the outside. He doesn't look like a standard bureaucrat. I mean, with his tats and his beard and his the hat that he wears most of the time. I mean, he, he's, he does not project, I'm one of the bureaucrats speaking to you like the two guys did at the, oh, yeah. the hearing last week. So... Uh, I guess the answer to your question, Ryan, is is it it depends. It depends on what they they think they need. I mean, obviously, Tom DeLong is not the guy. Uh, I'm not the guy. You're not the guy. Who is the guy? I don't know. Um, it sort of depends on what these insiders who are 
preparing to make some kind of move forward on this issue, uh, think that will think will be the most successful way at communicating this complex idea in a non-complex way. And at the same time, providing a little bit of reassurance to people, because obviously disclosure, if you just plain boom, here it is, folks, there could be a lot of people freaking out. So the message needs to be handled. And again, I don't want to get into it's all about how you handle the message. The message is the message. We have to, as a species, as people, have to figure out to handle it. But but I do think there are are lessons that can be learned from a crisis communication, as I indicated earlier, where you could say, okay, what what is likely to be our most successful thing? So, I would think. Uh, because of what we were talking about earlier, how people don't necessarily trust the government, and it's going to be harder than ever to trust the government when they admit that we lied about something of this magnitude for 75 years. Just having a person come out who is from the government and has been part of this will not cut it. So there needs to be other faces, other voices. And in fact, there may not be another Elizondo. There may be a dozen of them. And they may cut across a spectrum. Uh, some of them may come from the world of UFO research now. Some of them could be insiders. Some of them could be people who are retired, who come out of, uh, you know, come out of retirement. I mean, an, an example, he's gone now, but like a Colin Powell, for example, might have been a good spokesman for a while. You know, if, if, if during his lifetime and career, uh, he had, they decided to go ahead with it. He, he's somebody that could have reached across that divide. I don't know who the other people are right now, but I'm sure there are some. Yeah. And I, I want to comment on, on your dissertation about UFO nukes. There does seem to be a lot of a tendency of religiosity when we, when, when this topic is broached. A lot of people are so adamant that they're just trying to send a message to humanity. Don't play with matches. Right. Well, I think as Elizondo said, Usually when you, when you convey that message to children, you take the matches away, but e yeah. either way, I think, I think it's, I don't think it's good for people to bank on that's why, because I think it sent right. the wrong message to the Pentagon, because if I was in the Pentagon, I'd be like, these are not adults. These are children. They're, they're so convinced without any evidence that this is what this means. Well, no, it can mean a lot of other things. And I think we, as a civilization, we need to grow up. We need to grow up. And growing up does not mean banking on one interpretation as if it's gospel. Growing up means that could be true, but it could also be true that they're worried about EMPs using nuclear detonations high in the atmosphere that have been reported could take down UAP. It could also mean that they see nuclear technology as the most advanced technology of humanity. So they want to monitor us because they're scared that at some point, we're going to become so advanced that we enter their world and they see us right. as a bunch of crazy talking monkeys that might start a war with them or start negatively impacting their existence. So if I were to say anything to the world at large, as we progress, please, please, please stop with the mantra that this means that they want us to not mess with this weaponry. Right. That could be true, but it might mean something else. Let's let's get on our big boy pants and our big boy whatever. And let's let's let's. Let's acknowledge well, that there might be a lot of darkness associated with this phenomenon. And that's fine. That's nature. There's hurricanes, there's tornadoes, there's tsunamis. Uh, China and Russia has nuclear warheads pointed at Los Angeles and Washington, D.C. That's, that's OK, man. Well, that's this world, man. It's crazy. We got to live in a crazy world. Accept it for being crazy. Don't throw your religiosity <laughs> on me. You know, one of the things about the news business, Ryan, is I used to anchor the 11 o'clock news in a couple of markets. And one of the things that you always have to do on the news is the number one thing you have to assure people as you go on the air is, are we safe? You have to answer the question of, are we safe? So if there's a tornado on the way, uh, if there's a storm on the way, if there's uh, you know, anything threatening happening, you report on that because that's the first part of are we safe? So I would say going back to the Elizondo or future Elizondo thing. It's all related in a, in a great amount of uh, uh, relation to the nuclear issue. Whoever, if, if somebody were to come out today and say, yeah, okay, by the way, we're not alone and we're going to be talking more about this in the future. The number one thing that they would have to address directly would be this nuclear issue, because that is the clear, are we safe moment? All right. I mean, we do want to know three, three things. We want to know who are they, number one, what do they want, number two? And are we safe, number three? And, and I think, are we safe is the top of the pile here. Now, 
I don't know the answer to that. You don't know the answer to it. And it's frustrating. Isn't it frustrating that if contact has been going on for 75 years, I mean, it will be 75 years next month since the Kenneth Arnold sighting of 1947 and 75 years uh, the month after that since the, so, the, the Roswell crash. So it seems a little crazy that we're at this place where people like you and I, who just we just want to know the truth. Just, you know, we'll we'll handle it. Whatever it is, tell us about it. And and we're not being told. And and to say, well, we, we don't know if people can handle it. I mean, for crying out loud, what have we just handled? We've handled near revolution in the in this country. We've handled uh, the, the the pandemic. We've handled so many things. We've handled war. We're in the middle. I mean, we've got global warming. We, we are handling stuff. Now, I would argue that simply leveling with the people and saying, OK, well, why you're handling all that other stuff? Here's the big Uber picture you need to be aware of. Honestly, I think that might be the one Hail Mary for the planet right now, which is if you were to acknowledge we're not alone and there's another intelligence or actually possibly multiple other intelligences uh, interacting with us, that might be the one thing that gets uh, someone who's a, a, a Trump supporter and a Biden supporter to see the commonality they have instead of just their differences. And, and I, I think it's time. I think we need that. What sector of human civilization do you think is going to be the most upset and angered mm. by disclosure? Could with the scientific community or journalists? Like, is there a, a particular sector of humanity that you think is going to be the most pissed off? Well, it's, uh, all, I, I'm, I'm going to expand your question slightly. It's not only who is going to be the most pissed off, but who are we going to be the most pissed off at, right? Uh, on, the, on the second part of that, we're clearly, we're clearly going to be a little pissed off at the government, no matter how they spin it. And yet the irony is we'll, we'll need our governments to hold the, the world together during this. So the very group that we're going to blame is also the group that we have to look to for some answers, which is very odd. There'll be a lot of uh, pushback against the government. On the world of science, though, for example, I mean, listen, I think they get an F because the, the truth of the matter is uh, we should have been able to count on scientists to be discerning enough to say there's something uh, actual, uh, real, and 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 worth investigating here. And scientists should have gone and investigated it. But instead, they took this, this attitude, nothing to see here. They bought into it hook, line and sinker so that we're going to be mad at scientists, not happy with them. We're also going to be a little mad at the media because, you know, why, why does telling the truth about this? Why does it come down to guys like you and me on a, on a, uh, you know, on a YouTube, it's, uh, it's, it's so absurd. It's, it's, it's mind boggling. Yeah. It, so, <laughs> you know, I just say, so, okay. So I want to answer your question to, and I backed into it. The pe we're going to be mad at a lot of people uh, and we're going to be mad at them because they haven't done their job. Now that doesn't mean that they should give up and go home. It means that they should try to reform themselves and they should try to be, they should try to earn our respect again. I mean, it was the same problem institutions had after JFK and after Vietnam and after Watergate, there was work to do. And sometimes when the work didn't get done, it got worse and that may happen. All right. Who is, so the first part of the question was who's going to be, the most pissed off when this is announced? Is that the, is that the question? Okay. Yeah. So uh, I don't know that I know the answer to that. Uh, who's going to be the most angry about this? Well, I mean, I'll tell you who. Or even the most embarrassed for that matter. Embarrassed. There's a lot. I mean, the military should be embarrassed. And uh, uh, the people who are going to be the most pissed off, I think, frankly, will be people like you and me you know, who have spent a lot of time uh, researching this and realized that we're not crazy. And yet people have treated us as crazy. So there's a lot of a, a lot of that. I mean, I've often said, Ryan, I think when we first met, I told you, I felt like when I would go to, uh, you know, when I start talking about UFOs to friends and family, I got treated like the drunk uncle at the wedding. You know, people just like, well, there's Bryce doing this thing again. And that is really insulting when you think about it, if it turns out that we're right. I mean, in particular, if it turns out we're right, it, why are all these people that were right, why did they get subjected to living lives where they were marginalized, where they were uh, uh, talked about as if they were crazy, where the things that they reported as true uh, were denied? 
I, I think those people. So, okay. The, the, the real answer to who's got the most reason to be upset with people who have actually seen things or experienced things is, is the top group. Because they'll say, I was made to feel less than by people who knew better. All right. And then the next group will, as you go out from the center, will be the people like you and me who, who have been studying it and, and, and know something is real about this. And then as you go out, um, you know, like, because I, I, I'm trying to think about it, like my family, are they going to be angry about it? I don't think so. I don't think they're thinking on that level about it right now. I think uh, they'll probably say, wow, I guess dad was right, you know, and, and then they'll move on with their lives. I think there's going to be a lot of moving on with their lives. Uh, there'll be a lot of disruption. But uh, at the same time, humans have put up with wars that have destroyed entire continents and the whole world and still moved on. And we'll probably do it again. So when this all uh, comes to a fore, who are they going to bring on CNN? Seth Shostak, Neil deGrasse oh. Tyson, or Bryce Sable? And, and second part of that is, will I need a barf bag when this unfolds? You will need a barf bag because the first thing they're going to do is they're going to bring on people like uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, and, and, and I think, uh, you know, listen, um, I don't, I, I, I'm just not happy with a lot of the scientists, particularly the celebrity scientists, because Carl Sagan did this, too. They knew better. I mean, Carl Sagan knew better. I'm sure Neil deGrasse Tyson knows better. And for whatever reasons, for reasons that I'm not 100 percent privy to, uh, they've taken this other point of view and they're encouraged to do it. So, in fact, yes, when the president or the the uh, head of the United Nations or the Pope or somebody says something that sort of lets the cat out of the bag. And now we're all talking about it. CNN is going to go to their virtual contact uh, manager and they're going to start calling up Neil deGrasse Tyson and Seth Shostak, and they're going to get their time to talk about it. And they'll, and, and that's just, yeah, that's where you're going to need your barf bag. Uh, however, I hope that th what's been happening recently will also encourage a lot of these um, establishment media organizations to say, we need to cast a broader net. And, and who actually has been talking to us in a way that now that we know that some of the truth uh, is revealed as more truthful than others, let's get them back on. So I hope there'll be some of that. I think there will be. During the recent hearing, Representative Mark Gall uh, Mike Gallagher, I think of Wisconsin, he asked a great question and I gave him a lot of credit. He said, he asked the panel, the two witnesses, was there any UFO programs after the close of Project Blue Book in 1969 and before OSAP ATIP in 2008? And, they, and, and it was really weird. Representative uh, or, or Moultrie, he said, well, not, uh, I don't know any, I don't know of any officially or contractually. Why, what is that all about? I don't know. But either way, I, I later heard Representative Gallagher say that he does not buy that there were no UAP programs during that span of time, that it just doesn't it, it doesn't survive under scrutiny. So I want no. your, your take on that. Do you think it's even plausible that no. there's, there, there's incursions from unknown craft into military airspace, but the American government's like, ah, whatever, we don't need any more UFO programs? No, when they rewrite the history books, uh, they're going to have to include all those UFO programs. Um, I thought it was nonsense. I thought it was um, possibly that these two were selected because of things they didn't know, which would give them plausible deniability. Uh, at, by the same, t by the way, Gallagher, I, I, hats off to him. I was happy to see a guy at least go after it, um, and I think there'll be more to follow. The thing that I thought was also equally outrageous was um, not Moultrie, but the uh, yeah, it was Moultrie um, who I believe said this. Um, he said he knew about Blue Book, but he didn't really know about anything before that. Well, come on. I, I'm looking at my bookshelf here. I got I got a dozen UFO history books right here. Right. Um, I can tell you about uh, sign and grudge and all. You know, I can tell you about the estimate of the situation. I can tell you about the twining memo. I can tell you about Shulgin. I can tell you about all these things. And I'm just a guy sitting here in my house in Hollywood. Right. So if I can tell you that, what's wrong with them? And, um, you know, 
to, to be honest with you, uh, there are some great uh, historians out there. Richard Dolan, uh, uh, my partner on AD, is one of the, the most informed UFO historians I've ever met and probably should have been hired by the Pentagon to brief these guys for a week before they spoke. I mean, it was outrageous that they would come in and try to pull that off. And all I can say, Ryan, is, is it, the reality is if there are other hearings that's going to get harder and harder to, to pull off. And, and the rationale for it is going to get thinner and thinner, because if I'm a senator, I'm going to say, you know what? Why don't you get up and leave? Because we're done with you. you don't, you're not helping. And let's get somebody else in here. Um, I thought one of the greatest moments, I, I actually made a short little video of it because it amused me so much when um, Kristen Gillibrand, Kristen Gillibrand was uh, interviewing the guy that was going to be the IG, uh, the new IG. And he said, yeah, I'll, uh, you know, I'll look. She wanted a commitment about investigation. He said, well, yeah, you know, I'll get into it and, you know, I'll get back to you and, you know, that kind of thing. And she said, uh, actually, um, I'd like to see your answers before we vote on you in writing. And I'll never forget it. The guy looked dumbstruck that somebody would stand up to him. And uh, you probably you remember this, but maybe your viewers don't. But he had a two word answer. He looked shocked. And then he said, yes, ma'am. One of the greatest moments in UFO history, I think that if I was writing the history books, I would entitle an entire chapter. Yes, ma'am. Because I think uh, Kirsten Gillibrand's going to go down in history as being one tough a powerful woman who is going to help peel this uh, secret apart. I think she knows that's her destiny. I think she's getting prepared for it to be. And if there are Senate hearings that come up soon, she'll probably be right in the thick of them. You know, funny, Elizondo recently said on it during an interview that he's had some of these members of Congress uh, communicate to him that they've had experiences with UAP, which I think goes to the heart of how ubiquitous this phenomenon is. I mean, People in our own government have had encounters, right. and, and yet the Pentagon is simultaneously trying to tell us there's nothing to see here. I mean, it's, it's grotesque. My qu next question for you is- It is grotesque, though, by the way. I, I, I have to pay you a compliment. You are a man who chooses your words carefully. I follow your Twitter feed. I listen to your, your YouTubes, and I like the sense of humility you bring to it, which is, I don't know. I don't have all the answers, but I also like how you pick your words. It is grotesque. Grotesque is exactly the word for it. And it's why people are rebelling. I, I think what you're seeing across the country right now is an increasing amount of people who are just fed up, just fed up. I'm fed up. I don't want you to pretend to be transparent. I want transparency. And if you give me less than transparency, it is grotesque at this point. Anyway, I interrupted. Go no, ahead. That was a good interruption. Yeah. Uh, my next question is, you know, very recently, and I covered this in a, in a video of mine, Dr. Gary Nolan has stated that he has been in communication with a member of Congress, and the member of Congress told him that you know, they discussed the importance of having immunity. And then he later stated on Twitter that there is drafting legislation right now that is being planned out to give, to give people who, who yes. are aware of the issue within the Pentagon immunity so that they can testify openly without being prosecuted. What's your take on the need for immunity or, or are you against immunity for uh, witnesses who are dealing with this issue on an official level? Well, uh, I, I will say I spent a lot of time thinking about that when Richard Dolan and I were writing AD, we we because we were saying, if you have this entrenched of a secret, how do you pry it out from the body politic? What 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 sources and methods do the people have? And one of them uh, is immunity and the other is subpoena power. And I believe that's what's going to be the one two punch that really makes this potentially go much, much faster than you and I are even thinking right now, I mean, where it could just be explosive, because all it takes is that one witness that says the thing that's incontrovertible, and then everybody has to respond to it. And now we know we're not alone. So, um, but I think you need the, the one two punch. You need uh, Congress, which has vast powers uh, and can subpoena people and should. Now, we also know that when you subpoena somebody, they have the right to take the Fifth Amendment and say, uh, I refuse to answer on the grounds that might incriminate me. And that's a protected uh, right. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not saying that we're going to we, we in, in terms of telling the truth to ourselves about what this 
uh, phenomena is all about, we don't get to suspend the Constitution to do that. So that's still the way you're looking at it. So then the question is, what do we do to get people to feel free or to speak? And that's where immunity comes in. Now, immunity, in my view, is not just a blank check, though. It isn't like I, it's an it's not all the income free, like you know, you're playing a kid's game and you're saying anybody that's got anything come forward. Otherwise, you know, don't worry about it. No, uh, you need to say, listen, we are there's a period of immunity. It is X amount of time. And if you uh, want to be on the right side of this, you can come forward. You can speak your truth and you will not be prosecuted uh, at and you have to define what you would not be prosecuted for. So, for example, I don't think there's immunity for murder, right? So if someone went out and killed somebody in order to prevent them from speaking the truth about a UFO incident, I don't think you provide immunity for that. But uh, can you provide immunity for someone who's breaking an NDA? Sure. And, you know, so, for example, I think all of us, well, I actually, you know, I, I, like Lou Elizondo, I think he's he's been a great force for for truth here. I am a little weary of hearing the NDA invoked, and I think it is time that people don't have to invoke that. And the and and Congress could easily Congress can grant immunity. I just would call it limited immunity in terms of the scope of things that you give immunity for. So, in other words. Uh, as I said, you know, murder and manslaughter aren't going to qualify. Those people are still going to jail if that happened. Uh, but also the length of time. So that, for example, let's say that it's a six month period. All right. Well, then people have a decision to make. I'm either coming forward and telling my story as best I can, or I'm not. And if I'm not, then I could be prosecuted if I've committed crimes. And um, so that's how I would lay it down. But yeah, I believe in immunity being granted so long as it's limited and it's done constitutionally. What do you think? Um, what do you think is the, why do you think they've covered this up for 70 plus years? I mean, what, 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 what reasons would you provide as to your best hypothesis? Because obviously it's probably more than one reason, but what would be the reasons you would give for why the government has been so ridiculously motivated to to mislead everybody about this real phenomena? I, I think for the longest time, people have assumed that it was because uh, the greedy government needed to reverse engineer it and control the military applications and and all of that. I'm sure there was some of that. And in fact, I believe probably when they got the Roswell craft in 47, they said to themselves, let's try to keep this uh, secret for about five years, at least so we can study it. And I think they were probably shocked. If you were to talk to the original people who are the architects of that secrecy, they would tell you they'd be shocked that it was 75 years downstream and we're still arguing about this. Um, so, um, but, but I think that the reason is different. I think, uh, I'll give you an example. There's a physicist at the turn of the last century, a guy named Haldane, who made the statement, the universe is not only stranger than you can imagine, stranger than you imagine, it is stranger than you can imagine. I th believe there's probably an element to this where the truth is so odd and so challenging and so difficult to get your brain wrapped around that it's just not been something anybody wanted to talk about publicly, that they thought it would you know, unchain the, uh, the world in a way that they were not sure was a good thing. In other words, it wasn't as simple as, oh, well, we've got uh, Martians landing in New Jersey. Uh, let's get out the military and, and shoot them before they shoot us, that it's just something much, much stranger and, uh, and, and possibly far more complex. Uh, it, it, again, if there was a single alien species who was here studying us and they were scientists more or less, I guess we might be able to grab, get our brain wrapped around that. But what if it's 12 species? What if some of them are extraterrestrial? What if some of them are ultra dimensional? What if some of them are us from the future? What if some of them are from the earth? You know, what if there's this, who knows? What if MIB, that, that giant you know, conglomeration of other species, isn't a joke? 
it, what what if there's some version of that that's real? I mean, I don't know. Again, I'm not saying that I have inside knowledge about any of that. I'm just thinking that if there was going to be a reason why people would say, let's go slow on this, it would probably be that. How do you think the world is going to handle the proposition of abductions the, where, where, where alien intelligence is taking people out of their bedrooms and doing experimentation on them? I, obviously, that has not been proven, but I, I assess that it's likely happening. And if we get there where we collectively accept or at least collectively get very suspicious that is happening, how do you think humanity is going to respond to that? Well, it's I mean, that's the shocker, you know, and, and maybe are there good reasons somebody's done that? I don't know. I can't imagine. I wouldn't think it would be good if I did that to the neighbor's dog. So uh, I, I can't imagine it's good to do that to my neighbor. And so it's going to be ugly. That is an ugly truth uh, that if we have to face it is uh, is not a good one. And I do feel challenged by that. I know a lot of people are willing to believe sort of the nuts and bolts part of it. Okay, well, there's craft. They can, you know, they're like Tic Tacs. They're so fast and they do this. And okay, that's one level of getting your brain around it. But when you realize, or if, if it turns out to be true, that many, many, many human beings have been abducted. Holy crap. Well, I, that, that's just a big one. I'm, uh, I'm working on a, a project right now. It's interesting you brought that up because I'm working on a project that has to do with, um, you know, the, the very near future and, and how we grapple with uh, realizing we're not alone. And one of the uh, producers I've been uh, working with, <clears throat> that's his issue. He's, he is all up in, uh, in alarm over, well, how are people going to handle the abduction thing? And so I do, I do think that it's a great question. And I, I hear over and over from even researchers don't necessarily want to get into it, right? You know, we, there's a lot of people that go to UFO conferences and they have lovely speeches and they get on panels. And then there's the group off doing the experiencer stuff. And <laughs> the people who are on the panels are like, yeah, I don't want to touch the experiencer stuff, Right because they don't know if it's real. They don't know what they think about it. They don't know what it means. They can't understand it. And uh, But uh, let's just put this out there. You, you can't be a little bit pregnant. You can't, you can't do a little bit of disclosure. Uh, you can, it, once you say there's legitimate proof that we're not alone, then any reasonable reporter is going to say, okay, well, if that's true, then I have to ask what else is true. And that would put this UFO abduction issue squarely on the table. How do you think disclosure is going to impact us culturally when it comes to movies and music, how the MSM uh, covers this, books, documentaries? What do you think that, that the, the landscape is going to look like in that regard in a post-disclosure world? Well, I think uh, it's very funny when we were writing AD, I thought that about that a lot. And I thought, well, back then, uh, I, my, my glib answer was, well, Bruce Springsteen will write an immediate song about it. I don't know who's going to write the song this time. It'll be somebody else. Um, and maybe Bruce, too. There'll be, the, the, you know, culture does what culture does. Uh, things that get out in the zeitgeist are reflected in the culture. So there'll be uh, songs. Uh, there'll be plays, there'll be television shows and movies. Now, uh, having spent my career in Hollywood and, and done my fair share of UFO related things, I can't say I'm 100 percent optimistic that that's going to go smoothly because th there is still a sense in Hollywood, which is, well, let's not actually do something about what's really going on. Uh, can't we do an alien invasion where they come in and they they, you know, kidnap the president and, you know, Right. The stuff that's not happening there, there tends to be more reason why uh, 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 someone who can green light something feels more comfortable with the, the conflict of those kind of stories. Um, I've had the most trouble, I think, selling stories where I say this is based on a true story. Right. I've got the rights to this book and this is a great story and this is ripped from the headlines. Those are harder to sell. Now, whether they will be afterwards, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. I personally think that um, in the immediate aftermath of disclosure, 
the way the Hollywood marketing system, for example, would bring itself to bear on that is I think they would start looking around at stories that they maybe had refused to tell originally uh, because like an abduction story, for example, you'd say, well, that's just too weird. I don't know. Maybe no, people won't be able to connect with that. But if they're talking about that at Pentagon news conferences, well, yeah, then maybe you will make those stories. And I think there should be actually, if you think about it, there should be a demand from the audiences to see dramatized certain stories that are ripped from the headlines and are, are uh, true stories because they've been deprived of that all these years. And uh, so I, I think, look, it, it, it's not going to be easy or normal. Uh, almost any prognostication, either you or me or anyone else could make about exactly how it's going to go down, whether it's culturally or economically, uh, is, is still up in the air because humans are humans and we are going to roll the way we're going to roll. And so far, all we have is real speculation about it. We, you know, I'm able to speculate about it with you and you're able to speculate it about it in your, your Twitter column and, uh, and uh, on, our, on your YouTubes. But we don't know. We, we just don't know how people are, are going to respond. We do know, though, that human beings are, are versatile uh, types. And when we get painted into a corner, we don't necessarily give up. So something unusual will come out of it, that I'm sure. My, my perspective is if disclosure has a, a huge positive impact on human psychology and the human species, that's going to be a pretty big blow to the Pentagon because people are going oh, to be yeah. like, why did you delay this when the second you did this, humanity came together in a positive direction and we started treating each other better? Do you see, see that as a, a possibility? It's blowback and there will be blowback. Let's just put it that way. There will be blowback and certain groups are going to get more than others. But here's the problem. I said it about government and it's, it applies doubly about the Pentagon. Okay. The Pentagon happens to be somebody I'd be very angry about. You know, hey, you were supposed to send people down to Congress to testify, and they acted like they didn't know anything about anything. All right. So I'm angry at you. OK, now let's say that the Pentagon uh, is part of a disclosure effort, and they literally lay out some of this stuff that they they held back at the House hearing and, and that they've kept hidden for years and that the Air Force still doesn't want to talk about. And now they put it out. OK, you could be totally right. People at that point say, freaking Pentagon, we ought to bulldoze the place and start over. I could see people saying that. At the same time, though, you've introduced into the equation that we got company on this planet. We don't just have to worry about the Russians in Ukraine. We have to worry about aliens or something even weirder than that, whatever it is, and we'll feel threatened. And who are we going to turn to to keep us safe? Well, the Pentagon's got the weapons, right? So I just think it depends on what is disclosed. If there's a truth behind all this that isn't as scary as, as it might be and is more more scientific and that we really were just trying to get the the technology together, then people will be more open to uh, reforming the Pentagon. But if there's a scary aspect to it, they're going to be angry at the Pentagon, but they're still going to need them. And that'll be the interesting walk of the future. Okay. So probably my two last questions is number one, do you think the, the Pentagon, if they do in fact have recovered material, they can continue to pretend like they don't? for much longer? And number two, what would you say to people who try to make the argument that this is just a, a recycling of the past and there's really nothing new on the table as in terms of making progress on the UFO issue? Well, I think we are making progress on the UFO issue, and I'll come back to that in a second. But in terms of um, uh, getting the truth out, one of the things that I'm heartened by, uh, frankly, a number of the congressional people who have taken a lead on this uh, have background in law and some are prosecutors, you know, and, and there are ways to get people to tell you the truth. And I'm not talking about waterboarding. I'm talking about uh, good old police work where you get one guy in one room and you say, tell me your story. Then you go to the guy in the other room and go, I just heard this. Now, either you're going to tell us what you know about this or your immunity deal is going to be off the table. So what are you going to tell me? 
so I think that there are ways to get this truth out. And so I feel that um, we're going to be able to do that successfully. I forgot the second part of that question already, which was. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, materials. Do you think oh, if yeah. the Pentagon uh, has them? Will they be able to continue to pretend like they don't? No, 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 no. If there are um, if there's crash wreckage, if there's biological materials, if there's actual working craft that have been reverse engineered, if there are craft from other intelligences that actually exist and work, you're not going to keep that out once which which obviously is sort of answers your question earlier about why how can you go 75 years you got a lot to protect so you're willing to protect it with everything you got but once you've admitted that uh, we're not alone then what what I'm arguing is the people who have this this ability to to get the truth out of various people are going to go to work and there and and and, and that includes journalists, that includes senators, it includes uh, scientists. You know, people are going to start talking again, too. The people who feel like right now I can't really say anything about it, if they're reading about crash wreckage in the paper and seeing it reported on the news, they're going to come forward. So, no, I don't. I think once, once we're down the road, uh, we're down the road. So, that the only thing that would be sort of the mix of that would be that somehow before official disclosure has happened, there are reporters who are actually following the crash wreckage story and breaking crash wreckage stories in the news. That's different because then you still have potentially the Pentagon going, no, 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 that that, that never happened. Uh, but I'm 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 a disclosure optimist, to be honest with you right now. And I realize, you know, when uh, Ross uh, Coulthard and I are on our podcast, need to know, sometimes he comes across as the uh, he's the pessimist. He's like, yeah, mate, this is never you're not it's not going to happen. And I'm like, well, I think it could. And and I, and I think that actually the truth is, I think you're on my side on that one. I think we both agree there are forces mighty forces that have been unleashed in the last few years. And while a lot of people want to say, yeah, I don't see that. Uh, I just think they're wrong. I think or there are mighty forces out there Absolutely. and it's not going to be long. And and I'll, I'll answer the question of my own poll. I don't think we're going to have disclosure uh, tomorrow or next month. I would think if there's a disclosure kind of event, uh, we are going to step into it uh, after the election, after the 22 election. But I'll tell you this, I think the issue of UAP, UFO reality will be a real bona fide issue in the 2024 elections, both presidential and congressional and senatorial. That would be amazing. So I'll just let you, um, if you have any last things you want to say, go for it. And also tell my audience where they can find you if, so that they can sure. read and listen to your work. Well, listen, uh, I, thank you. Um, I do have a podcast with Ross Coulthard, which many people know because he wrote a brilliant book last year, In Plain Sight. It's almost like a must read for people. And uh, Ross and I have never actually physically met, but we became friends over Zoom, just like Ryan and I are friends over Zoom right now. And <laughs> and I've, Ryan, I feel like you're a good friend of mine. And we haven't actually sat down. I look forward to the day where we're, we're in a, a, a restaurant and we can have, we can order dinner or something. That would be great. Um, so Ross is sort of one of my Zoom friends. And we decided to put on a podcast where we would try to keep it short and sweet. 45 minutes or less. That's our goal. It's called Need to Know, and you can go learn about it at needtoknow.today, needtoknow.today. And then I also am, am you know, I have a, a whole other part of me, which is dedicated to uh, writing these articles. And I write those for uh, Medium and also for the debrief under the, the Trail of the Saucers brand. And um, I don't even quite, I, I know that if you, um, I think if you, you know what? I don't even know what my URL is for that right now. We'll put it in the need to know dot com, dot today, not dot com. Need to know dot today. And, and also, uh, I, I would just say, um, uh, Ryan, I'm active on Twitter like you are. I'm at Hollywood UFOs on Twitter. And um, I look forward to the dialogue with everybody. And, and I'm really pleased to be one of your first interviews, by the way, on, on this new in adventure you're on. And, and I hope many more to come. Thank you. Yeah, I plan to do one to two a month. And thank you so much, Bryce, for coming on. It was a great show. And I, I think my audience will really appreciate it. 
All right. Well, look, thank you. And, and you know what? I do hope when there is some actual disclosure event that we'll do this again and we'll, uh, we'll get deeper into it. But anyway, thank you so much for including me. That would be great. You're welcome. See ya. Please do not forget to subscribe. And if you'd like to support this channel, you can check out my merch shop where I sell t-shirts. You could become a patron. You could become a YouTube member. You could even give me a one-time donation. Or you could just slap a like on this bad boy, and I will appreciate it so much. Thank you so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Special thanks to all patrons, YouTube members, those that have bought merch, those that have given me one-time donation. I couldn't do without you. Thank you so much. See you in the next episode.